Hi guys, welcome to our chemical engineering tutorial brought by the ChemEng student. In this lesson we're going to take a look at some reactor engineering interview questions and the complete responses that you should be looking to have during your interview. So if we take a look at question number one, we have 10 questions in total. Uh, question number one asks us to um, basically list the main types of chemical reactors. So a fairly simple and standard question that you should expect if your job has something to do with reactors. So generally speaking, we have four main reactor vessels. We have batch reactors, we have continuous stirred tank reactors, known as CSDRs, we have plug flows, known as PFRs, and fixed bed reactors of FBR. Now you can also have a fixed bed catalytic reactor, which can fall under the same category. Now each vessel will have its merits and demerits, but if you're only asked to list the main types, then that is a sufficient um, answer for this particular question. Question number two is, why does steam enter from the top side of a jacket? So what the interviewer is looking for here is, A, you know what a jacket is, um, in the context of a reactor, don't talk about a jacket that you wear personally, um, and then having the idea as to why the steam would come from the top. So while it does seem logical that the steam would come from the bottom, but there's a, an issue that arises when the steam begins to condensate because the steam will condensate as it loses heat. So if that is the case, then when the steam comes in the bottom, there wouldn't be a comfortable or sensible passage in order for the condensate to leave the system. So what would happen is you end up with something called entrainment. It's not exactly the same thing, but the general principle is there in that the steam that rises will suspend some of the condensate. So therefore, you would prevent either the condensate leaving or preventing the steam from reaching all the way to the top. So that means that basically the heat that the steam will bring will actually be reheating the condensate rather than rising to the basically the, the reactor surface. So it has a decrease in the efficiency of the, the jacket's function. Question number three is, what is the difference between adiabatic and isothermal? So chances are, if you have done reactor uh, design or in fact any element of chemical engineering, the chances are you would have heard of these two terms. And they are very common and pretty much the, your bread and butter when it comes to you know, reactor design questions. So both terms are related to the movement of heat or association of heat. However, they differ in terms of the overall location. So adiabatic refers to a system whereby heat, and indeed you could mention um, mass, there's no heat or mass transferred to or from the surroundings, i.e. you would use a jacket in order to maintain adiabatic conditions. Whereas isothermal conditions, that assumes that the operating temperature remains constant and uniform within the reactor itself. So we don't have any fluctuations within the operating temperature. It's assumed that the whole system operates at exactly the same temperature. Now granted, both of these are fictitious in nature real life reactors would have non-adiabatic and non-isothermal operating conditions. If you're interested and want to know more about uh, reactor engineering, reactor design and all these principles, I'll link some videos um, on the channel in the, the comments um, section, but we also have a fully comprehensive reactor design um, course. So again, I'll put a link in the description um, if that is something that you are interested in.
Now question number four is, can you describe the type of vessel that is being modelled by this energy balance? So sometimes in an interview, you may be presented with an equation and you need to work out what is actually happening within the equation. So we're told there is an energy balance and that should be evident by the physical properties that is present in the equation because you wouldn't have the specific heat capacity and you wouldn't have the surface temperatures and reference temperatures within a material balance. And we also have the value of U, which is your overall heat transfer coefficient. So what you would need to have in the back of your mind is what the overall general um, balance is for any given system. But the clue here lies in the presence of the bed density. So the bed density only comes into play when you have a fixed bed catalytic reactor. So this equation is modeling a fixed bed catalytic reactor with a varying superficial velocity. Now you may ask, well, why is that a varying superficial velocity? Well, it's due to the fact that US, sometimes known with VS, is inside the differential. So that means that we have varying temperatures and varying velocities with respect to the reactor length. So these are things that you can explain during the interview and these will really set you apart from all the other candidates in the interview. But additionally, as we mentioned in the previous um, questions answer, that adiabatic systems imply there is no heat or mass transfer between the reactor and the surroundings. So we're actually missing the transfer term within this balance. We're a term down and the term is the dq term. So because we don't have that in here, the equation basically governs a adiabatic fixed bed catalytic reactor. Now we do have a fully comprehensive um, fixed bed catalytic reactor um, tutorial, I'll put a link in the description to that, and that goes through a step-by-step -step process on how you will model fixed bed reactors. It's really, really detailed um, and it's actually based on a case study that I did personally as well. Now question number five is, what are the key factors that affect the rate of a chemical reaction? So a fairly standard um, basic question, but one that comes up a lot in the interview process, purely on the basis that if you can answer these very basic questions, then the likelihood is you're going to be a good fit for the job. The question like the one before is quite an advanced question. So the chances of everybody getting it right are fairly slim. But these are the questions that will dictate whether or not you progress to the next level. Because these are so standard that if you can't answer these, then the chances are you aren't going to be suitable for the job. So the, so the answer that you basically want here is to highlight that you understand there are several key factors that influence the rate of a reaction, and then just begin to list them. So you could say the temperature, but expand on each of them and say what would actually happen with the parameter. So temperature, a higher temperature, generally increases the rate of the reaction. Pressure, if it mainly, well, it mainly is applicable to gas phased reactions. And again, you have to employ the use of some basic chemistry to know that the effect of increasing or decreasing the pressure will have on the equilibrium of the reaction and that is down to the moles of gas on the left and the right hand side of the equation. So again these are extra points that will really set you apart um, from everybody else if you include these in your response. The concentration, um, even mentioning the word collision theory principles will most definitely have you at the top of the list for this type of question 
because you are taking it to a completely new level. If you were simply to say you increase the concentration, will increase the rate of the chemical reaction. That is technically fine. But if you include collision theory to say, well, the higher the concentration, the more molecules, the more material is there in order to increase the number of successful collisions, i.e. that will increase the rate of the chemical reaction. That is a perfect answer for this type of question. You also have the catalyst. You can mention that the fact that the catalyst will provide an additional energy source that will lower the activation energy in order for the reaction to occur. And then surface area, you increase the surface area, you increase the rate of the reaction. So an example would be using, say, a fine powder rather than a coarse solid material. So that's, a, that's another example um, that you could throw in there. Question number six is, can you list some key characteristics of a PFR? Now, they may ask this at the beginning, so they may assume that you know what a PFR stands for. They might not actually tell you that it's a plug flow reactor. So if they don't, it's good just to, to say what it actually means. So PFRs, plug flow reactors, um, now there's varying degrees of how you can list some of these characteristics. But they're typically long cylindrical tubes or can be made up of many short tube banks and they typically have the following set of characteristics. We have operate at steady state conditions, that is basically a given for the majority of reactors. We have no radial variation within the reaction rate. We have radial um, mixing. We have higher efficiencies than CSTRs with the same space time. We have a higher rate at the inlet of the PFR and the concentration will change down the length of the reactor as well. Granted, there is a few more that you could include, but these are the, the core basic ones that you should be including in your response. Now question six is how would you describe a transient process? Well, the transient process is one in which the value of any given variable will change with respect to time i.e. what that means is it's the inverse to a steady state system. Now that means that inherently things like batch and semi-batch processes are all transient processes because the, for example, the rate of the reaction will vary with time, the concentrations of the reactants and the products will vary with respect to time. So therefore these types of models are based on transient processes. So you couldn't assume steady state conditions. Number seven, can you list the different possible algebraic representations of the accumulation term within the general material balance? Now these are the kind of questions that when the interviewer hands you a piece of paper and a pen usually sends shockwaves down your spine. So it's normally one of the most daunting parts of the technical interview process is now having to, you know, bring the stuff from the back of your mind and be able to articulate it on a piece of paper. But if you're talking about the accumulation term, then what you want to do is you want to, there are basically three key ways of doing it. There is a couple more, but these are the, the core ones is accumulation can be the rate of change of mass with respect to time. Now these are all differential equations, so that's what it would imply with the algebraic representation. So the dm by dt. You could also have the rate of change of the liquid height with respect to time, so that would be dh by dt. You could also have the rate of change of the volume with respect to time, so dv by dt. Now granted there are variations with the mass, you could express it in terms of moles if you have you know, reactions taking place. Um, so, but these are the core um, probably answers that the interviewer would be looking for is so as that again you understand that the accumulation term is always with respect to time. So 
if you have accumulation that takes place, you may not have a steady state system. You will have a transient state system. So that's something to keep in mind as well. You could filter that in to your answer. Question number eight would be, if hydrogen is used as one of the reactants at extremely low temperatures, what construction material would you use? Now, for those of you that I may have taught in person um, from my current university, um, or some of the students that I have uh, worked with uh, through the ChemEn student, um, you will know that this is a question that I personally got asked as I was an undergraduate student, and I know some people got asked this in their interview questions as well. So this is a, a quite a curveball question, but once you see the answer, you will never forget it. But one of the most common construction materials for reactors is stainless steel, for a multitude of different reasons. It's relatively cheap in comparison to other materials, and it's actually quite robust, with a, a wide range of different ones. You know, you've 316, you've got um, high carbon, you've got, you know, just a, a plethora of different types of stainless steel. But the issue with this particular system is that in the presence of extremely low temperatures of hydrogen, it makes the stainless steel become brittle. And what that would mean is that if we had, in addition to really cold temperatures, we had significantly high pressures, we would have, the, the likelihood of a rupture um, is pretty much 100%, it's gonna happen. So the presence of extremely low temperature hydrogen would render stainless steel unsuitable for the given system. So you would have to look at slightly more expensive materials. So you could go for high carbon steel, you could go for a tungsten alloy, or it's highly unlikely, but you know, if you really wanted to be secured, you could have carbon fiber. But I personally wouldn't recommend building an entire reactor vessel out of carbon fiber. But for the sake of you know showing different options, that's a, a potential. And you could argue pros and cons for that as well. Depends on how much detail you actually want to go into. Question number nine is, what parameters are used for characterization of non-ideal reactors? So this is getting into the more advanced types of questions for reactor engineering. Because when we talk about, you know, the CSDRs, the, the adiabatic, the non-isothermal, all that kind of stuff, we're still dealing with ideal to semi-ideal reactors. Whereas non-ideal reactors are pretty much the most accurate depictions of the real vessel that you're going to get because it mitigates so many different assumptions that up until probably your final year of chemical engineering, you probably won't come across these types of systems. But if you want an advanced um, answer, just in case, then these are the kind of things that you're going to have to include. Because in order to categorize non-ideal reactors, the key parameters that you need are what's called the residence time distribution function, the mean residence time, i.e. that's the, the amount of time the material spends inside the vessel, the cumulative distribution function, and the variance. Because these allow you to find things that is called the dead spot, and the bypass rate because ultimately when we assume things like perfect mixing steady state they don't actually exist they they are completely fictitious so that's where in the non-ideal systems these are the parameters that you need to account for these discrepancies in the models and then the final question uh, for reactors is explain what the reaction yield is so reaction yield of a chemical reaction basically represents the efficiency of the process by simply comparing the actual quantity of the product that you have produced versus the theoretical maximum quantity. So you would, beforehand you would work out, well what in theory should I achieve? And then what you actually achieve, the ratio of that 
is what the yield is. So the higher the yield, the more efficient the process. And you usually convert it because at that point it would be a decimal. You usually just multiply it by 100 and that will give you it in its percent form. So the higher the yield, the more efficient the process. And again, these are all key things that you can add into your response to make it that bit more um, comprehensive. So that's the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful in giving you some ideas and inspiration for how to articulate and formulate some of your responses to any specific reactor design questions um, that you may face in an interview. I will also put a link um, in the description to a general technical interview um, series of questions and responses. Uh, we have a video that goes into that in some detail as well, so I'll put a link in the description to that. But thanks for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us reach as many chemical engineering students as possible. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing you in another video.